Gentlemen, welcome to our combined SPE Thailand and SPWLA meeting for the month of June. Uh, for those who do not know me, my name is Su Jin Tana, or you can call me Ning, uh, and I'm supporting the section tonight as an MC. The mission of SPE and SPWLA is very similar, which is to collect and share industry information with you. And we both have a vision to create a better energy future for all of us. The focus of SPWLA is on petrophysics, and they want to play a major role in education and creating awareness. If you have time, please check out SPWLA website. Tonight, we have a couple of announcements regarding our SPE section and the SPWLA chapter, followed by our main presentation, which is a talk by Dr. Christophe Germain. Hopefully, there will be some time for questions. Then we will have a couple of closing remarks. And finally, we will do two lucky draws. First, a couple of announcements from uh, SPWLA and then two announcements from SPE Thailand. Uh, may I invite Kun Andrew uh, to make the announcement for SPWLA? So, my name is Andrew Cox. I am the SPWLA Bangkok chapter. Uh, president. <laughs> we, um, just to confuse everybody, FBWA, which is often mispronounced, is the Society of Petrophysicists and Well Law Analysts. Petrophysics is basically the study of, petri of physical and chemical uh, properties of rocks and their contained fluids. So I like to say that we are the glue that holds all of the subsurface disciplines together. We work with the geologists and tell them what they've got wrong. We work with the reservoir engineers and tell them and feed them all the information that they need. Basically, uh, we quantify what the hydrocarbons are, where they are, how much there is, and an estimate of the deliverability of those hydrocarbons. The SBWA. SBWLA uh, has an annual conference. It's actually happening this week in, in Texas. So there's a few of our committee who are not here tonight because they're over there. 
But I would like to uh, promote the SBWLA International, as we, as we like to call it. Uh, annual fees are uh, discounted for local staff, so uh, $40 US. And that gets you a range of um, benefits. Uh, the biggest one uh, the, uh, that we're trying to do is to promote the um, expansion of education for petrophysics. So we hold monthly free webinars online and we also give out the journal, which uh, happens uh, six times a year. So please do look us up online and uh, yeah, support us becoming, and by becoming a member. Alternatively, we hold meetings here in Bangkok at the Jasmine Hotel, just down the road here on Sukhumvit, Soy 23. I hold them basically on the last Thursday of the month, except in July and December. And our, so our next presentation will be on the 31st of August. Uh, attendance is free. We have good, solid sponsors, and they provide uh, enough food and beverage for all of our attendees. So I'd like to thank PTT, Valura Energy, Chevron, and Gaia, who are our, our, our gold sponsors, and also Aspen Tech, EDSL, Xlog, and Scientific Drilling, who will also uh, sponsor us. So thanks very much for your time. Uh, this joint meeting is um, one of the highlights on our calendar. We have uh, provided the, the, the uh, presenter for tonight, so please do uh, enjoy the event, and hopefully we'll see you in August down at the Jasmine. And now we will continue with a few announcements from the SPE Thailand section. Uh, first, on our membership. So today we have over 600 members, and wow, uh, we are back to the 600 <laughs> level again. <laughs> After uh, being dropped uh, below 600 for a few years, so now we're back to 600. So this is combining 393 professional and 221 student members from Jalalongkorn University, Suratnari University, Queens of Songkla University, and Chiang Mai University student, uh, student chapters. I'm also glad to see our professional memberships in Klein Trend with 81 new members in May. However, we still have around 92 professional members from 2022 who have yet to renew their membership. So uh, please recheck your membership status and if it's last, please consider to renew it. And to all of us, please invite a colleague to join our meetings or even better, uh, to join SPE because we always need new members. SPE Thailand is still the largest professional oil industry organization where you can regularly meet and greet in a relaxed environment. So on the topic of our membership, there are plenty of reasons why you should maintain a valid status and even more reasons to join. I will not go through uh, all of this as you can see here on the screen, but worth mentioning that the key benefits of belonging to one of the most active SPE section in Southeast Asia are the regular opportunities to network, share knowledge, and socialize with peers of the same interest in our industry. These companies are the sponsors who support us, our Thailand monthly technical meetings for this season. For, all, for any of you who may have just tuned in uh, for this meeting, if you would like to see your company name here, please reach out to us or to myself. Uh, we appreciate your support and of course our society needs you. So please give a round of applause to our sponsor. In on the industry liaison of the SPE Tech section, uh, the new season will start <laughs> in August. Uh, so I will be sending out uh, um, in, in September, I will be sending out uh, an invitation for you to sponsor us uh, in the month of August. Or if you are interested, if you have not yet been a sponsor and are interested, 
please feel free to contact me. Okay, now I would like to hand over the microphone to our program chair, Kun Kassian, who will do the honor of introducing our speaker tonight. Welcome all the participants, both the member of the two societies. It is uh, my honor and all of the board committee to have you here. Uh, you joining us, I think we see regular faces and you know that we host this joint meeting uh, once a year, right? So it's quite important to us that, you know, the two societies join and, you know, see, we see different faces as well. And again, the speaker tonight was, you know, brought to us by Kun Andrew, who has mentioned earlier, so I'm sure it's a very good quality. So anyway, without further ado, let me start introducing our speaker for this evening. Um, the speaker tonight, he's the founder and managing director of Epslot since its creation in 2005. His current interests are with the development of technologies for the acquisitions of high-quality core-based data, and core digitalization processes for machine learning and applications. Speakers hold the BSc degrees in physics from the University of Liga, I think, if I said it correctly, <laughs> from Belgium. I unfortunately cannot speak Belgian. He obtained the MSc degrees in civil engineering from the University of Minnesota with the group that invented the patented the scratch tape technology and a job PhD degree from the University of Leeds. <laughs> <laughs> Apology. Leech. Okay, okay. Apology. Leech. Yeah, from Belgium and the University of Minnesota. Ladies and gentlemen, please a very warm welcome for our speaker this evening, Mr. Christoph from S. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, for attending this presentation. So I will just clarify something. Um, the name of the city is pronounced Liège. Oh. <laughs> you couldn't do that anyway. <laughs> there is absolutely no problem. I'm sure that almost nobody not, knows where, where it is exactly. So <laughs> Belgium is a very small country, and everything is close to Brussels, so you can call that Brussels as well. I mean, <laughs> So um, let's start maybe with um, the presentation. First of all, I'm very honored to be um, to have the ability to give you this presentation on the latest technology innovation that we have been uh, doing in our very small company, Epslog. Um, so I will start maybe to show you a sketch about the devices that we are developing and using within our uh, company to basically try to acquire uh, some high resolution data on cores. I'm not sure that everybody is familiar with core, because I know that there is a mix in between uh, SPE and SPWLE, um, LA, sorry. Uh, but basically, we re recover some core uh, material from uh, underground surfaces, which are usually cylindrical, and we try to perform some tests on that to characterize their permeability, porosity, density, mineralogy, in order to better understand the geological models that needs to be developed in order to subsequently, and in the later future, try to produce hydrocarbons. Um, those cylinder cylinders of rock are not always as nice as shown here. They can be fractured, they can be uh, as well uh, in very bad state, they can be just a piece of sand or, or rubble. But basically, the the, the, the old fashion of doing some analysis is to try some even smaller samples, some smaller cylinders, and try to uh, perform some laboratory measurement of that. With Epslog, we started to believe, because uh, we developed the scratch test a long time ago, that uh, we can do some other measurements. And exactly similar to what you do with wireline um, down the hall, we try to actually acquire continuously data out of those cores and basically obtain logs. Um, of course, because we have uh, the, those cores uh, at the ground surface, we can be much more precise and have a much better resolution than that, that logs can, can offer usually. 
So we have developed a system that we call the Wombat. I know that there is a, at least someone from Donanda here, so he knows that perfectly or looks the animal. Uh, I will not try to make the link uh, between the why we call that, but he can come to me later and I, I will explain to him. But basically, we, we fasten the core on a bench, uh, a bench top equipment, and we will start to basically prepare the surface and then acquire a lot of data with a multi sensor approach. So, the way we are preparing the, um, the surface of the rock or the rock itself is that we try to create what we call a mini slab. So a mini slab is basically a flat surface on which we will be able to conduct a lot of measurements. And the way we are doing it, we are using some scratch test, let's say, applications where we grind the surface of rocks with PVC cutters. Exactly the same kind of the, the one that you can find basically on, a, on drill bits. So we just remove a very small skin at the surface of the rock. It can be only 3 millimeters on a, uh, a 4 inch inches diameter core. And we level that surface to obtain an accuracy of basically uh, micron scaled. Okay. Once we have done that, we can start to acquire a lot of other measurements because we don't have mud covering the, the outer surface of the rock and so on. This, uh, this equipment is also very versatile because we can test as well the gas equal. So a cut. So basically, that's one third of the rock. We can test the slab face or the outer face. We can even test B cuts or C cuts because we are working a lot in Norway where basically they split the, the last part of the core into two pieces. One is going to the NPD, so National, Depetro National Petroleum Department. The other one is kept by the, by the uh, company. And as I mentioned, so when, once we have prepared those, um, the surface, we can start to acquire a vast list of, uh, of uh, data. The first thing, of course, is to take a picture to try to see the macro changes of geology, for instance. Uh, you can see here, for instance, a kind of clear transition between a, a large grain sandstone to a final grain sandstone. Uh, it's a panoramic images of basically one meter long. It can be three feet uh, in the case that we are working in the US. And um, we capture basically about six centimeters with a resolution of 30 uh, microns per pixels. We can take as well other measurements, and this is um, something that I will have to jump on my computer to open your neighbor link, or maybe you can try to do it. So it's only a five centimeter image of a piece of rock. So in reality, it looks like, like this. And you can see the, the kind of resolution we have. Basically, we have here a pixel that represent two microns. So it has the same kind of resolution as scene sections for those that are very familiar with it. Then we can run a portable, exa oops, sorry, a portable XRF system that will measure elemental concentration, again, continuously along the rock. So we will have an idea about the variation of the geochemistry and as well uh, the mineralogical changes. We have an additional kind of uh, test where we basically measure the pressure at which the rock is failing to try to obtain now a geomechanical input, which is a UCS log. We use as well a laser scan technology to get an idea about the roughness of the rock. So from that, we will try to infer, in case of plastic, some grain size index, so basically, or change the grain size centimeter per centimeter. And the idea is extremely simple. Basically, when you run a scratch test application, you remove the grains from the matrix of the rock, and basically it leaves a footprint. The smaller the footprint, the smaller the grain. The bigger the footprint, the bigger the grain. So somehow we look at the variation of the rugosity of the surface after the core preparation by uh, PDC cutters. And then we have developed as well a core permeability system that will give us an idea about the, the probability, the permeability of the rock. So we have obtained all that because all those measurements have been conducted on um, the same benchtop equipment. The core has not been physically moved. All those measurements are depth collocated, which is quite important because you can start to make correlation between them and try to understand or change the fascias by looking at each individual, let's say, uh, measurements. So the idea is to basically try to integrate all those measurements extremely rapidly, especially when you are working on fresh cores that nobody touched before. 
to try to deliver the, the, those data in an integrated format to basically uh, provide that to um, the core analysis specialist that will have to select blood samples and as well uh, decide where to preserve some uh, intervals. So once you have done that, we, have, we are passing to the last stage of the, let's say, the study, where we basically try to um, somehow QAQC the data that we got. And when I say QAQC in the terms of a sedimentological point of view, so we have developed as well an additional piece of software with an expert sedimentologist to try basically to replace the work that was, doing, that was done in the, in the core storage, taking a small plastic sheet, putting that on the core with a lens, magnifying lens, and trying to estimate what is the grain size. Nowadays, we can do exactly similarly kind of uh, analysis by just plotting this similar grain size, grain, uh, grain size that we have defined on specific when it was bins, for instance, or intervals that the sedimentologists want to uh, basically interpret. But that was as well we start to define the, um, the composition of the rock and the structures that, uh, that are visible. So we re really create a kind of um, digital world that will be extremely important later on to try to basically develop some AI. So you create your data sets here and on which you will apply some AI technologies and models later on. We have as well developed a, a even finer kind of a labeling sections where you can start to basically contour automatically some um, pictures to try to recognize it, uh, in, the, in the later stage with deep machine learning applications, some specific structures that you want to, uh, to do in the, uh, that you want to see in the rock. So of course we will never replace the, the work uh, of, of a sedimentologist, but we try to basically pre-mash a lot of their work to go much faster and to, be, to become more accurate and as well uh, to try to get a certain um, robustness in, in terms of their uh, descriptions. So now let's jump on the real case applications um, where we start with, uh, we have basically, we apply with Synapse Lab three, three types of families of machine learning um, approach or models. The first one is unsupervised. We call that unsupervised because you don't need to have any labeled data sets. So the, the, the algorithm will try to find its way alone without any, let's say, guidance. Then we have the, the super, supervised world where basically you start to need to get a certain uh, data sets that you can train your algorithms to perform what you, you train them to do. And we have there a subdivision where we go for regression and as well classification and segmentation of images. So each of them have specific targets, of course, and specific uh, aims, and will have to be uh, trained on a specific set of data sets. So let's, let's start first with uh, unsupervised clustering analysis. The idea there is to try to get extremely rapidly again when you don't have any data on a fresh course that you just cut, to try to recognize basically uh, the variation of your rough ashes. And I'm speaking here about a centimetric resolution. Okay, so we try really to group, basically create some families of rock that are represented by those colors that share exactly the same properties at different location of the, at different depth of the, of the uh, reservoir. So what we do basically, we take our large data sets and we combine meaningful inputs that are coming from different disciplines to try to basically define some universal data sets or patches that will be used basically by all the different disciplines that will have to, uh, to work on the, the core analysis. So we have a uh, rock mechanical, sedimentological with a grain size. We have as well a uh, brightness and color index that can be related to mineralogy and as well elemental concentration. So by just running those clustering analysis, now you start to have a static, static graphical descriptions without knowing what means each, each color. We just know with our, the way we have defined those colors, that colors that are close to each other, where the contrast is not high, that means that they share more of the same properties. If you have a very big contrast, that means that you are in completely different types of formations. But we've seen that I have tagged now each facet or each color with a certain kind of, uh, let's say, information. And this comes from a later stage analysis where we use box plot to try to basically interpret how the cluster worked and what, what uh, it, it used to basically uh, differentiate one cluster from another. And so, 
Uh, if I want to um, basically understand what is this phase six here that represents only 5.4% of the core that I've analyzed, I look at where the data are distributed for strength, grain size, calcium, aluminum, and all the other inputs that I use uh, to create those fashes. So the ticket line here represents where 75% of the, the data were lying for these specific uh, fashes. So you see directly that here, for fascia 6, we have the definitely the strongest formations, which represent about, that goes from 50 MPA to 95 MPA. If I look at the grain size, the grain size is not really discriminant, because we have another cluster that shares exactly the same, let's say, uh, interval. But definitely, I know that I still have some rugosity, so I have some presence of, uh, of quartz there. And then if I look at the calcium concentration, you see clearly that the calcium concentration is by far higher and the other ones, we go for a percentage that goes from 5 to 10 percent, although the other ones are below 2 percent. So you start to agglomerate all those kind of information that you have collected, and you start to make an interpretation. Basically, I know that it's strong, I know that it has some grain size, and it's calcium. There is a lot of calcium. It's a calcite cement and sandstone, and I have, we have, of course, the backup of the photographs and the images to, to basically uh, secure all those kind of interpretation. If you look at the red, it's quite easy, it's medium strength, it's not really discriminant. Smallest grain side, no calcium, highest aluminium content. Aluminium is a trace for uh, clay, clay content. That's basically our shared uh, intervals within the rock. If we look at the two, the three main clusters that represent 85% of this specific well, we have basically the main discriminant, as you can see, is the grain size. We have the coarse grain, we have the medium and the fine. So directly, I start to build my interpretation based on pure data analysis. Uh, although note that this one, the, 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 the fine grains uh, interval, is slightly larger strength and as well as slightly larger aluminum content. It's a shelly sand. It's not a clean sand like the two others. But that might as well help your interpretation for petrophysical analysis later on and understand why the permeability and porosity should be lower for that specific uh, fashes. It's a for CCUS applications where we run all those core DNA data and fascist analysis uh, prior to get any plug results. And we define those colors without knowing anything about porosity and permeability. Plug results arrive months later, and you can see that actually we have two trends, and it's already well clusterized as well. So basically, the, the, the fascias that we have uh, found with the, 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 the solution that I've showed you before actually giving some explanation and are extremely well correlated to porosity and permeability plug data. So you can see here, for instance, that we have an upper trend, which is the best reservoir quality. It's even split into two parts, the fascist one here, the fascist three there, we have the fascist four here, and basically the fascist five, and fascist two is localized there. Now, if I try to understand why I have two trends, basically, it's quite easy. I look at my iron and aluminum content. I see directly that it's higher for the reddish it's a clusters. That means that I'm not in front of clean sand. I have some clay content into that. That explains why, basically, I have for equivalent porosity lower permeability because the both roads are blocked by the shale in presence. If I look at the cluster three and one, that are the upper one, you can see directly that we have absolutely very much lower aluminum and um, iron content. So those are the cleaner sand. And you can see that we have a subdivision there. Look at the grain size. We see that this cluster, the cluster one, has actually much bigger grain size, so bigger permeability and porosity than the, 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 the green cluster. And again, we try to, to ex, ex, explain very easily by looking at some additional data why you have a, such a kind of organization in your open plus. If we look at here the blue cluster, basically it's the same story as before that I showed you large calcium content, larger strength. It's basically the calcite cemented sandstone. So the calcite is, is obturating all the pores and, and all the pore fault. So you have no permeability, no porosity left there. So if we go, I will go very fast on that. But if you start to have as well a target data set, let's say you try to convert the data that we got into some, some other data that you are not able to measure continuously, you can use regression techniques. You can predict rock properties like porosity, permeability, density, by using a network or, or let's say, a multi, uh, multivariate analysis. And as well, you can even correlate those uh, continuous data, core data, to wirelines. So 
This is a, a first example that I wanted to show you. Basically, here we have converted the geochemistry logs into basically mineralogy by taking XRV, so calibration point, and you define basically the model to pass from geochemistry to mineralogy. And here, that's basically the correlation that we obtain from the prediction and the real XRD measurements on 75% of the XRD uh, measurements that have not been used to define this model. You can see that most of the time, except, except for some specific minerals like elite, smectite here and apatite here, we have a very good correlation between the prediction and what has been observed into the, the XRD measurements. The last on that, but it's just to show you as well the comparison between the uh, core data with white lines. Uh, basically, you have a total porosity here taken from a giant uh, carbonate field in uh, Abu Dhabi and the rock strength taken from the, from the scratch test, so basically from the uh, core data. You have the luxury when you have continuous core data at high resolution to filter that to match the resolution of the white lines, which are completely different. It's, there is an order of magnitude between those two. And so basically, it's it's relatively easy after to build a, uh, a multivariate analysis to try to find first which Y lines are connected to the definition of strength and as well to basically best fit it. As you can see, we have found that the total porosity was a very good candidate, but as well the ratio between VP and VS to basically derive the UCS. And that's what we have done by fitting the CD and E uh, variables. And this is the comparison between the core um, the core data and the wild line derived UCS based on those kind of progression. You can use multivariate analysis, you can use neural network to do that. It's relatively easy. Those are other applications on different lithologies, and you can see that usually we have some very good actually match or correspondences with uh, what you observed on the wild line uh, problem. Now, uh, maybe the most um, challenging part is to go into uh, deep machine learning to try to basically develop some algorithms to help or support the geologist and the sedimentologist. So we have, of course, a lot of different tools at our disposal. The first one is maybe uh, the classification. What means classification? I've taken here images where you can see some people just walking on the, on the, on the shore. Um, and the classification basically that you consist in asking to the e, to the uh, deep machine learning, okay, does, do I see a picture of sea, beach, or mountains, or cities, or traffic lines, or plains, or this is the classification, and normally the deep machine learning will have to tell me, okay, most probably, let's say 90% sure, this is a beach picture. So you take a picture and you try to associate what you call a, a class, okay? We have more precise ways of trying to um, investigate those, to those images. And basically, that's, that's what we call segmentation. So you have here the, seg the semantic segmentation. So basically, you have a number of plants. So basically, in this, in this case, sky, sea, beach, and human beings. And you ask the algorithms to point every pixel and to affiliate every pixel to a certain class. So you see here that all the light blue pixels are representing the sky, the yellow are representing the water, the purple are representing the beach sand, and the red are the humans. So you try to identify or to, to basically affiliate a class to each single pixel that you see in your images. The instant segmentation is slightly different. You don't care about trying to tag every pixel that you have on your image. You try to find which pixels in your image are uh, belongs to one class. Okay, so in this case, find me the human beings, and you see that all the rest of pixels of these images are black because there it could not identify or relate those pixels to human beings. And we have as well descriptions of, of now segmentation of each individual uh, individuals that are uh, located on, the, on this picture. And then we have the panoptic, which is really the the, the holy grail. It does everything at once. Okay, but you can start to think that you can use classification for, let's say, ethology identification, and in, 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 even the, the model brain science that sedimentologists can, can be uh, trying to, to, uh, to identify. The semantic can be now a bit more pronounced. You could have here, let's say, some sand, plastic reservoir, you could have a, a mud or a shale, uh, basically sections into the same image, and you can start to identify which lithologies are visible on that images. 
Um, if you go to instant segmentation, that's even more pronounced, you could start to try to identify each sil single grains visible on an image and basically start to count their diameters and create a grain size distribution. That would be even more interesting. You could start to try to allocate or to find the, what are the, where are the laminations, the metaclass, the fossils, and so on into your images. This is extremely precise kind of uh, applications. So for that, we have, as, as I mentioned, we are providing this kind of CD panel and label panel where this one is really devoted to uh, um, classification purposes. So that's really cent or image centimeter per, per centimeter. We try to classify those images, uh, the textures and the composition. And there in the label panel, you can start to build and basically QAQC all your prediction based on uh, segmentation, so uh, um, instant segmentation. Uh, and semantic segmentation of images. And those are basically some uh, real case examples on CCUS application again, where, of course, the, the variation of the sedimentological uh, descriptions as well as the position is quite important. So you can see our original ultra high resolution images that I showed you an example just before. And in here, you can see that the algorithm started to basically identify all the grains that it was sure um, that they were present. And so now you can start to cut those images into, let's say, bins of uh, one centimeter and start to count basically all diameters. And you end up not anymore with a, let's say, grain size index, but a real grain size distribution curve. And because, um, to be honest, I, I really like deep machine learning uh, models, but I do not trust them. It's a black box. You don't know what it does, and you will never know it. The only thing that you can do is start to QAQC um, the data or the prediction that it does. But imagine that we have now 190 meters of holes, where you have a prediction every single centimeters, and that you have to look at 100 times 190 meters. It makes like um, 90,000 uh, pixels, okay? Or let's say images to QAQC. So this is not feasible. So the way we try to challenge that is basically to, to compare different ways of measuring at least some uh, markers of grain size, like, as I mentioned, the rugosity of the group, through the, the laser scan that we have, and basically the prediction of the segmentation of images. And you can see that it's working quite well over there, over there. And then here we have completely a mismatch between the prediction of the two methodologies. We know that we need to be attentive to that particular, and that we need to QAQC, that specific interval. In this case, it was clay and silt on which basically our segmentation algorithm has not been trained. So it was, did not know what to do with it, basically. But you can see again the very good consistency between the rest of the data. And so we can end up basically with a now grain size distribution show we, showing you the, the, the smaller grains and the larger grains that you have basically, and the histogram of those uh, uh, distributions all over every single centimeter, but you know that you need to disregard this part because basically you know that the segmentation algorithm was not working uh, effectively. This is another exam example of this US application where we have overburden and underburden, again, green fields, let's say, untrained methodologies. And now what was very interesting to note is that we had a very good match here in terms of prediction from the laser rain size and the segmentation of images. But here you can see that we have exactly the same trend but an offset. And actually, what we learned after giving the data back to the geologists is that in here we had we were facing a fluvial depositional process, although here it was more of a sand dune depositional process. So what happened in the fluvial depositional process, basically you have a lot of sediment that falls into and very fine grain sediments that falls into the, the interstitial grains and that start to fill them with materials. And so in here, what you could see is that when the grains was removed and the interstitial space between the grains were filled, basically in that case, with some very fine grain sediment, flattening some of the laser scan that we got, so removing some natural rugosity. That's why basically here we have a much lower prediction in terms of grain size from the laser scan, because it's a fluvial depositional process, compared to this one, which is a sand dune deposition process. Last but not least, this is something that we have done as well for mining applications that were very interested to try to identify, uh, in this case, garnet uh, minerals. So when we look at the garnet uh, images, or let's say the 
description given by the uh, geologist there, the garnet has certain signatures in terms of um, colors and chromatics. I said, okay, maybe we could do, we could automate those kind of, um, let's say, uh, work to try to find their abundance and as well the grain size of the garnet. So we use in this case a chem scan analysis, which is a very detailed mineralogical analysis where all the garnet grains basically are represented in red color here. So we collocated again the same images and we started to train a deep machine learning algorithms to try to recognize automatically based on these pictures, but trying to target this kind of definition, the presence of garnet. And this is basically the results that were obtained, where you can see that all those kind of uh, pink orange zones are actually associated with garnet automatically by the deep machine learning algorithms. So this is another application where we found quite uh, effective the, the use of those kind of technology to automate and facilitate uh, the predictions. So I would like now to uh, thanks, uh, first of all, the audience, uh, but especially uh, Andrew Cox and the people of SPE that have been allowing us to present this technology. It was really a pleasure to come back to Bangkok. We are not based from here, but uh, we are always appreciate to, uh, to, to be in a uh, it's such a great country and, and, and city, and um, copy up to uh, the entire audience. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions from the floor? Okay. Excuse me, uh, I'm Warren from Chevron. Thank you for your presentation. I have some questions that may not directly relate to the topic. With the power of AI right now, can we uh, train a model with a call that has the potential to produce sand? Now that we have some sand production from the lift tool and create a safety concern and many problems. Okay, that's, I would say that yes, you have always the ability to try. The question is in your data set that can be extremely large. Do you have any connections with the capability of producing sand or not? And sometimes it can be a multi kind of varied uh, reasons that can be, uh, of course, the strength, but that can be as well the in situ um, pressure, power pressure that you have that can basically explain and the decline in, in terms of power pressure later on on your productions. Uh, it can explain the value or not of sand. So I would say, yes, of course, you just need to get the right data, although you don't, you don't know it. But if you don't have anything in terms of data related to, to a sand venue, you will never be able to predict it because it will not be able to find its way within the data. So the, the very nice thing with AI is that as long as you have some inputs that connect, let's say, to what you are looking for, you can, you can try to achieve it with more or less success. And again, you need to be extremely careful about those kind of black boxes I mentioned. So you need to uh, verify and QAQC very often and maybe increase your data set. It's not like if you could do train some uh, machine learning without any iteration. So you need to build a first model that you will see that works maybe in the first data set that you have, and then you apply it to another data set and it will fail miserably. And then you know that you need to QAQC these data sets and maybe put it into the training. Because what the algorithm does not see, or it's never seen, will never be able to predict. It's exactly like if you have never seen a cat in your life and I, was, is it a, and I ask you, is it a cat or not? If you have never seen one, you don't know. Um, this is uh, Colin Whitaker retired from Stanley. Um, in Norway, they have Darcy Sands in their most, produ in their most productive reservoirs. The ability does your technology fall over people for sands are not competent? I will just show you maybe some backup slide and for that you are, you are going to ask. So I will try to switch up on that. This is. Um, the, our proper reliability system that you can see that has been deployed on the, the mini slab. And this is uh, true gas permeability taken with plugs, uh, odd crops, okay? So they were cleaned, which is always better compared to the proper reliability that you could have. And you could argue that those data are fake because they seem to be very uh, 
very good. But again, because we prepare this surface at the micron scale, you start to have some very good sealing properties. Of course, if you have extremely large rain signs that can start to leak, but that will be the problem, let's say, of uh, any kind of permeability test. But basically, we go from less than a hundred of millidarcy to more than 10,000 uh, millidarcy to 10, 10 darcies. The second question is, uh, when I was working as a log analyst, um, I was asked by your company, how confident are you in your analysis? How many months salary would you wager on your interpretation? And I would like to offer you that same question. <laughs> okay, um, very good question. I think that we should define what is a monthly salary first. Because um, I'm a freelance, so that's not that easy. Uh, it's, it's not uh, really something that I can see as constant uh, over the months. But, um, okay, um, I would say that I've been uh, building this technology for many years with a lot of very competent persons. I've not done that alone, that's what I want to, to say. But we are, within our company, we spend almost 80% of uh, our time into R&D and QAQC. So we do, we spend a lot of time. So I would say that I'm pretty confident about the measurements that we are, uh, let's say, uh, <laughs> depends in which currency as well. But uh, uh, I would say many years. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Krilwan from PTTV. Uh, my question is, uh, you show us the um, un unsupervised uh, method. Yes. And that's for sand shell um, kind of domain. Have you been able to do a similar unsupervised um, training or you know prediction with um, carbonate? Yes, we have done that. Um, so that works exactly similarly. You, you you take basically the same inputs, so the same sensors. Of course, I will never start to um, include the same elements, for instance, into the analysis because the science will be mostly related to silicon and carbonate will be, we will be looking more for calcium and magnesium, for instance, as inputs, because you will see the level of dolomitization with the magnesium and more carbonate assigned with the calcium. So you need to make your shopping into the, the list of elements that will be measured and, of course, adapt your selection or your emphasis of the inputs that you consider depending on the rock formation that you have. As well, the laser, for instance, scan that we have doesn't produce any grain, grain size there, right? Because there is no grain size in carbonate or can be, but uh, um, so what you need to think about is what the rugosity means into carbonate and mostly is the presence of pores. So you can start to relate, let's say, the, the rugosity of the surface that you have to more into a porosity index rather than a grain size index. So again, you need to be extremely careful. For instance, for grain size, we know that for the sedimentologists, uh, for plastic, the, we know that the sedimentologists are very interested into their separation into when it spins. So we don't use a very uh, stupid clustering k-mean analysis without any, let's say, guidance. We have the luxury to put more weight to emphasize the, let's say, the one measurements compared to another. This is especially uh, meaningful when you have, for instance, 10 uh, elemental compositions with one grain size log. Those ones will start to take, because they speak more to each other, will start to, 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 stay, to take more, let's say, uh, um, they will take advantage of their, their strength rather than into, in front of a single log that represents only grain size. So you need to play a bit with the weight to try to emphasize some logs compared to some others. But you, it's not very, I would not say that it's extremely sensitive. So if you use a, an adjustment weight of three or four that will produce basically the same results, the boundary will be slightly changing, but overall it remains fairly uh, reasonable robust. Um, <clears throat> now for carbonate, yes, we have definitely uh, run that onto some Middle East uh, cores, and the results were very similar in terms of uh, interpretations, and uh, the process remains exactly the same. Would you say that it's... Um easier to uh, do um, unsupervised machine learning on sand shells, even just than the carbonate? No, no. Especially if you have on top of that some insight about what you're looking for. So 
in the sense, if you know that some certain minerals disturb your analysis or are critical, you can start really to select, again, to do your shopping into the, to the XRF list of elements that you have at your disposal and to use them. So I would not say that it's easier. That's, that's basically exactly the same process. Right. And my second question is um, in the, uh, the supervised one. Um, do you have enough kind of um, gold, um, you know, gold standard or ground truth data to actually, uh, you know, uh, basically leveling your semantic uh, classification? So um, I would say yes and no. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, something that I've never seen uh, that have never been seen by the, the algorithms. But, but it's been verified by person, right? Yes, exactly. So we, there is, the, the way we are training um, those uh, and creating the data sets are the, basically the labels mm -hmm. created by some uh, sedimentologists and geologists. So that's not by, uh, by people that do not have any experience. So we, we have a partnership with a, with a laboratory and they have a, 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 let's say sedimentological uh, sections into it that basically use the software to level uh, the, the pictures that we are taking. And then we use that specific output to train the, the, the neural. But sedimentologists can be wrong as well, right? So, uh, but we, that's the core standard. Yes, that's the, best, that's the best in class that we can do. Exactly. But, uh, um, another one, one last one. Will you be able to share with us your you know, F1, the accuracy that you get from that? So, yeah, definitely we can we can uh, try to give you that, but again that feels spe that feels specific. Okay, so um, we have been extensively working in uh, in Norway, so we have a very good uh, nowadays uh, database on uh, plastic reservoir over there, so from the North Sea. Uh, we have started to work a little bit in um, in uh, Middle East as well, but again. Um, more data you have, more accurate normally it will, it, it will be. There's one last question over there. I think I have a question. Yeah, I think. I will try to speak loudly. Um, it, it sounds like a very straightforward procedure. So, uh, from receiving a call to giving an answer, it takes you how long? Um, I, I will again uh, answer you by asking you a question. Um, everything depends on the number of equipment that we have on site and the size of the job. But basically, uh, to run a one meter analysis with the full, let's say, uh, sensors, it takes about one hour. So, um, for instance, we are testing nowadays uh, 1,000 meters of uh, legacy course in Norway for creating a database for a company. Uh, we have four equipments working in parallel with two shifts per day. So we can reach basically uh, about uh, day. And uh, QAQC is relatively rapid in terms of when you Again, we have worked a lot on the, the software that does that help us to do that. Usually, when we finish a well, I would not say of 1,000 meters because I would be definitely lying, but uh, a well of 100 meters within 24 hours, all those analyses are done and data integrated. That's basically uh, what we can provide. Uh, Chris Platt from BTTP, same as Kunkru there, but my, my question is a little bit more basic, I think. Um, what specifically are your applications regarding the CCUS? I saw, I saw you had that mentioned on one of your slides. Which particular minerals are you looking out for and what is your experience? Which which projects have you been working in, and what are the ages and types of formations that you've been doing the CCUS work? So, um, spoken like a driller. We've been um, recently, uh, we got a few, few occasions to work on CCUS. Uh, I think that over, over the last year, 
It's still about 1,000 meters, of course, coming from different countries. And that was US, UK, but as well uh, Norway. Um, to be honest, I cannot answer your questions regarding the, um, the age, because I'm not a geologist. I'm an uh, engineer in space physics, so that's quite far away from my uh, background. And um, yeah, I leave that to the specialist. Um, but uh, that being said, I think that uh, we, we use uh, the technology exactly in the same purposes than uh, for um, oil and gas production, hydrocarbon production. It's to try to get much faster uh, guidelines for further analysis and to basically um, know where you need to take uh, samples to do very extremely precise uh, measurements. The advantage that we got, as I mentioned, is that we combine not only uh, sedimentological or petrophysical or, or geological measurements or geochemistry, but as well some rock strands, for instance. In the latest case, latest CCUS um, project that we were involved to, the importance was to try to characterize not only the reservoir, so the, uh, the storage capacity, but as well the overburden and the underburden, because they, were, they wanted to make sure that they could get uh, ceiling integrity, of course. So having um, those kind of concrete logs, again, are more inputs for the core analysis and try, again, to guide the selections of plugs for further analysis. I'm not saying that I will solve or that this technology will solve all the questions. That's not uh, the purpose. The purpose is to really to, to try to optimize the way core analysis has been made, and as well to try to use those continuous high-resolution logs to upscale the properties that you can obtain sometimes on just a centimeter cube measurements. So it's really to try to propagate, select more efficiently, more intelligently, and then propagate the results through the, the patches that we have uh, that we have analyzed, where that are sharing the same properties. So that's really the strategy behind it. No? Okay. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I was kind of interested more in like, the predictive mineralogy and the reactivity with CO2, for instance. Okay, like. Well, okay, another, another question maybe, seen as uh, for the people of us, multi questions. Um, there, are, there are several companies around that are doing this type of. Uh, these type of measurements or core and cuttings. What what uh, what does your company offer that's above these other companies that are offering similar services? There, there is no other companies that have such a kind of uh, complete path in terms of core preparation integration and interpretation um, and as well uh, the capability to create with these data sets uh, very easily some uh, training sets for deep machine learning so that's where really we started to uh, to be confident about our strategy is to not leave the data just with uh, hundreds of logs of high resolution logs and they don't have time to use them we usually try to communicate with them with all the tools to go extremely fast into the integration and try to uh, answer the specific questions without there need to be uh, uh, the time to be consumed on doing those all those kind of things, although they, they are not prepared, they don't have the, the, the software so the, to deal with such a kind of uh, uh, high resolution logs. Okay. Maybe we one last question. Uh, from Andrew. <laughs> Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, just curious, on this slide here, you've listed your full data set of strength, mean grain size, and so forth. Um, you're taking the core from a couple of kilometers down, bringing it up. Are you doing any overburden corrections or pressure corrections or anything like that? Or how do you calibrate to in situ rock properties? Um. You, you, you need first to know what are those rock properties, and if you want to calibrate your models, you will need to go through the second part of the presentation, which is regression. So basically to try to establish some links 
between your targets, so basically your in-situ properties and your core analysis. What we do is only core analysis at atmospheric pressure. Okay, so we don't try to, uh, to basically uh, be back into the in-situ conditions because anyway, it's too late, the core are brought back to the surface, they started to, uh, to, uh, to, to break, to, uh, to expand, to, uh, to dry up as well. And also something that I maybe did not mention, but uh, it's extremely uh, interesting and, and useful to conduct those kind of studies as soon as the barrel are open. It's what we are doing now on a daily basis in Norway, for instance, because once your core has been dried, and especially for clay, for instance, uh, they can start to basically break. And also you don't know how the properties will, will be, especially for geomechanics, will be affected this time. So uh, if you look at clay material in a uh, long time ago, it was cooked to make it to make bricks because they knew that temperatures and drying start to solidificate and sometimes strengthen those, those kind of material. So I would say that once you are you have left your core uh, dried, you're never sure about uh, the impact of those kind of things. So trying to conduct that would be my at least my, my feeling try to conduct as many as possible measurements up front as soon as the cores are open and still fresh in good condition rather than leaving them you know in a core shed drying out and and maybe you will not be able to uh, to to see them as they were when they were taken so the best way I would, if i could answer that your question like is the best way to try to be as close as possible as the the, the in situ conditions or let's say the intact state of the rock would be to conduct measurement as soon as we can. So you, um, strength DCS, for example, Yes, you're going to need to calibrate that before you actually use it for anything. So again, we measure UCS, which is by, by definition uni, uh, uniaxial or unconfined composite strength. So you don't need to calibrate it. That, that is a rock property by itself. Um, what we measure is UCS, unconfined composite strength. Of course, if you're trying to use this data to basically infer well both stability or sanding issues, you will need to conduct other tests to basically calculate uh, the friction angle estimate, the pore pressure, the in situ, uh, the in situ stress, to try to basically fit your model and predict what will happen with time. But again, what we measure is an unconfined basic strength. Okay, so no in situ measurements. We need to try shell test and other kind of things to do that. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Christoph. Uh, I think we still have a lot of wines and beer. You can also continue to ask him later after the meeting in the extensive town. So, so, um, <laughs> this talk, <stop>, right? Sorry. <laughs> From Leech University. <laughs> So on behalf of SPE Thailand, please uh, uh, let me invite uh, Kun Panik, who is the Vice Program Chair and also the ENP Awards Chair, to present our token of appreciation to the speakers. Okay, and continue with our closing remarks. And the happy draw post. Okay, a few closing remarks before we go to our lucky draw. Um, for our next meeting uh, in July, let's honor our SPE Thailand ENP Awards of 2021-2022 seasons winner project uh, ENP Corporate Transformation by Kun Jum Pot from PTTP, who will be delivering this talk on Thursday, July the 20th here at the Vanguard. And SPE actually have uh, so many events, uh, which you can go to SPE Asia Pacific website uh, to check out all the upcoming events under SPE. And also there are many ways to get in touch with us. Um, now we have our SPE Thailand website back online <laughs> after being uh, unavailable for several months. <laughs> so that's working. 
Um, or you can follow us on Facebook under Society of Petroleum Engineer Thailand section or at SPE Thailand. Um, another channel is our LinkedIn group. Uh, so you can join LinkedIn under SPE Thailand section group. Uh, we also have a line official accounts um, where you can follow our upcoming events, register or even apply or renew your membership right from the line application. Um, please scan the QR code shown here if you would like to uh, connect with us uh, through these three platforms. And now, uh, lucky draw, uh, can we please have uh, Dr. Christoph uh, in front of the stage again to help us with drawing to winners. And prizes are sponsored by the SPE Thailand section and in appreciation of your attendance here tonight. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you will get a, a blanket, a bed sheet with comforter. <laughs> <laughs> so, we will postpone the lucky draw is given to S. Dot D E O U J T Y D E P I I'm on the back side. <laughs> He's OB. OB? OB? Okay, one more. Yeah. <laughs> trying to spell well your name. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Joe A.T. Joe? Joe? Joe T. Joe T. from Seattle. Okay, second drop. <laughs> if you remember our last meeting, we gave away the fan, right? so there was the mobile AC. So today we gave away the blanket, so mobile heater. <laughs> Okay, so uh, from Baker Hughes, Kula Pap, Mr. Kula Pap, or Miss. Okay. Have a good sleep. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you again. And I think we have, uh, we still have two for one. Please. This is the last slide. Um, two for one at the Random Bar on the ground floor lobby level. And please. Uh, mention that you're coming from the SPE uh, Thailand meeting. They will give you this uh, two for one. Uh, again, thank you for our sponsors for tonight. Uh, and have a good night and continue your uh, conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to take a photo. Can we get the first slide? I think. Sure, sure. You mean the slide with the next one? Well, you can spell like that. Oh, you can think it's here. It's W-L-P-A. Yeah. 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 Perfect. 
Thank you very much again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what did you come up with this? Oh, society, oh, yes. 